Let's talk about digital identity, the podcast connecting identity and business. I am your host, Oscar Santolayo. Hello and thanks for joining today. Today we'll hear how certification authorities contribute to securing internet, but also what is the role in their digital identities. And for that, I have a very special guest. Dean Cockling brings more, more than 30 years of business development and product management experience in software security and telecommunications. As Senior Director of Business Development at DigiCert, he is responsible for representing the company in industry consortia and driving the company's strategic alliances with technology partners. Mr. Cockling is also the past chair of the CA Browser Forum and the CA Security Council. Currently, he chairs the ASC X9 PKI Study Group. He holds a BSEE and MS from the George Washington University and an MBA from Babson College. Hello, Dean. Hello, Oscar. Thank you for having me today. Very welcome. It's great talking with you, Dean. I'm really very excited to talk about your career and what you're doing today in this world of um, certification authorities, particularly in DigiCert. So I would like to hear first what was your journey to this world of digital identity. Well, I've been involved with public key infrastructure and certificate authorities since 1996, actually, mm -hmm. starting out uh, with a company called GTE Cybertrust. That business was sold to a company called Baltimore Technologies, which was then sold to a company called Be Trusted. Then I left that group and uh, worked at GeoTrust for a while before we sold the company to VeriSign in 2006. And then I went off and worked at another startup, which leveraged a company based in Germany, in Hamburg, Germany, called TC Trust Center. That company was then sold to PGP in 2010. And then PGP actually was sold to Symantec a few months later. And Symantec then acquired the uh, assets from VeriSign, mm -hmm. including GeoTrust. So I basically joined a lot of my colleagues again. <laughs> and we kept that going until 2017, when the website security business was sold by Symantec to Digicert. And so now Digicert, by the virtue of acquiring all the assets from Symantec in the website security, which included GeoTrust and VeriSign from way back, now is the uh, world's largest certificate authority, public certificate authority. So it's been sort of a long journey, but uh, the good thing is I've been dealing with a lot of the same players as well as new players in the industry and have learned a lot along the way. So I'm really happy to join you here today to talk a little bit more about certification authorities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fabulous. Very, very consistent and long experience in the in a very specific field that is PKI until today that you are in the biggest one, that is DigiCert. So DigiCert, as you said, is the largest commercial CA. But for ones who are not so familiar with what is what are the role of these uh, organizations, how would you define what is a certification authority? Well, that's a good question. You know, certification authority plays a very key role in a public key infrastructure. In a public key infrastructure, you have a concept of private and public key pairs. The private key is something that you always keep with you. You never leave it out of your possession. But the public key is something that you can send to others that they can then use to encrypt messages to you. However, when you send that public key to someone else, how does that other party know that that's coming really from you and not a hacker? Mm -hmm. And so the role of the certification authority is to attest to the authenticity of that public key. And what essentially a certificate authority does is sign your public key with the certification authority's private key. And that basically tells the recipient that, ah, someone has certified that, yes, this public key is authentic. So in a simple example, let's say you and I need to communicate and we've never met before. And you say, okay, I want Dean, I want you to encrypt the message to me. And I say, okay, Oscar, send me your public key. So you send me your public key. But if your public key has not been checked by a certification authority, how do I really know that that public key is your public key? Because if I send you a message that's been encrypted with your public key, then only you can open it. But how do I know a hacker hasn't intercepted that conversation and inserted their public key into the conversation? So Having it signed or attested to by a trusted third party, which is a certification authority, gives me confidence that someone has checked that that public key really belongs to you. And that example is for the secure mail world. But looking at things that are used every day for websites, websites use public key cryptography in the form of digital certificates or that little lock that you see mm -hmm. on the screen to attest to the authenticity and the person who is behind that website. So I think we're going to talk a little bit about that more coming up. But in general, a certification authority is someone who attests to the authenticity of a public key. 
Sure, yes. thanks for that. And certification authority is very important in security. As in, the, in, the, in the example you have described is how to secure email, for instance. That actually we, most of us are not aware, but most of us are sending email encrypted. So that's most of the cases and it's pretty transparent from our side. Um, securing, securing a service such as email, securing a website. Security is one of the pillars of certification authority. What about digital identity? What is how a company like Digicert view digital identity? Well, we view it as something that's very critical to operating on the World Wide Web. You know, the World Wide Web has been a great tool to communicate, to learn, to educate others. But unfortunately, that world is also filled with people who don't have the same intentions in mind. And these people are typically known as cyber criminals or hackers. And so we want to make sure that when you're doing business online, when you're communicating online, that you are communicating with the party you expect to be communicating with. And so we feel that digital identity is extremely important in e-commerce, in education, in business, on the World Wide Web. We want to try to minimize the effect that hackers have by assuring people that those they are communicating with are, in fact, who they say they are. And so digital identity, when you can't see someone, you can't touch them, you can't hear them, plays a very, very important role. I think the European Union especially has recognized this, and they've put out some legislation and digital frameworks around digital identity. We are right in line with that. We support that. We want to make sure that e-commerce is safe on the web by assuring each party that their digital identity has been verified. Mm -hmm. So that's the, mostly the, the digital identity of the organization, not, let's say, the end user. Well, it could be both. You know, the identity of the organization in, in SSL certificates, for example, is key. But, for example, in as we talked earlier about SBIME certificates, mm. we're talking about an individual. And that individual could be part of an organization or it could be just an independent individual. Nonetheless, the identity is extremely important and we want to make sure that it's verified. So I know, for instance, some of the main applications of digital are TLS and IoT. Could you tell us a bit how is uh, identity in this in these fields? Right. Yeah, in TLS, I think, as we just started to talk about, ensuring that when visitors go to websites, that the website that they believe they are on is, in fact, that real website. This is extremely important. And maybe we know just by typing in a domain name that we're used to going to, that we're sure we're on the right website. But what if we search for something on the internet and we're doing a using a search engine mm -hmm. and let's say we're looking for um, sunglasses and we're looking for Ray-Ban sunglasses. Well, I happen to know that searching for Ray-Ban sunglasses is actually a very tedious task because there are so many sites that advertise Ray-Ban sunglasses that it sometimes it can be difficult to find out who is the authentic site? Yes. Which site is actually the real site for Ray-Ban? Is it Ray-Ban.com? Is it Ray-Ban.com? Mm. Is it Ray-Ban.us? There are so many different permutations of the name that the average user, it's impossible to tell which is the real website. And so being able to identify that website with a digital certificate that actually shows the identity of who's behind that website is very, very important for e-commerce, for financial transactions, and for any other highly important transactions online. Now with IoT, it's a little bit of a different story. With IoT, we have so many different types of IoT devices. Of course, we have consumer devices like baby monitors and webcams, but then we have much more professional devices like medical devices used to monitor blood pressure or drug infusion pumps. We have uh, SCADA systems, industrial controls, so things that take care of water dams and nuclear power plants. We have vehicle control systems now with the advent of autonomous vehicles. We have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, mm -hmm. and these all have to be authenticated, and they're done securely using digital certificates. So there are some critical applications in IoT that require identity and authenticity and encryption to happen, and this is best done with digital certificates. These IoT applications are much larger than we would think of for World Wide Web applications because, for example, let's talk about cable boxes. Cable TV boxes have digital certificates in various parts of the world, and we're talking about hundreds of millions of devices. That's a big number, and that's a lot more than the number of websites out there today. So, the scale is on a different level for IoT devices than it is for TLS. But nonetheless, identity is extremely important in both cases. 
Yeah, it's very interesting this distinction you make between um, websites. That's something where we are much more familiar, where we're facing every single day. And we have this idea of the, we did this image, uh, mental image of the of the padlock, the green padlock mm -hmm. or similar. Um, but yeah, but when we extend that to IoT devices, you mentioned uh, self-driving cars communicating each other or even this set of boxes, no, the cable boxes we yes. have at home. Yeah, the numbers are much, much bigger. So it's quite interesting that in most of these applications, most of these set of boxes or all of them, are they using certificates, the majority of them? In many parts of the world, that is true, especially in the European Union and in the U.S., Many cable boxes use certificates to authenticate the device as well as to provide encryption for the device. So, yes, that is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's excellent to see that, uh, to know that, that these certificates are already there in, in devices that are people really trust a lot because you buy these devices and you, you trust that it's, it's already secure. Yeah, another interesting aspect, again, with the padlock on the web browsers. Many people don't know that there's, there are, of course, organizations who work to build standards about the best browsers that we use also. So we don't notice how important these are and who is doing be behind that. So, of course, there are a few companies that ship the browsers, update them, but there are organizations even less known that are working on that. And you are currently the vice, vice chairperson of the CA Browser Forum. If you can tell us a bit about this organization and what has been its impact on line security? Sure. The CA Browser Forum was formed about, I would say, 14 years ago. And the purpose of the forum at that time was to come up with standards for digital certificates that are used on the web, formerly known as SSL certificates, now replaced with the new protocol TLS. Mm -hmm. At the time, remarkably, There were a few companies issuing these types of certificates, but there was no recognized standard for how these certificates should be issued, renewed, revoked, etc. And so a bunch of certificate authorities, competitors actually at the time and still are, as well as browsers, these are the companies that actually use these types of certificates in their environment, got together and said, okay, let's come up with standards for different types of certificates. And the first standard they came up with was for extended validation certificates or EV certificates. And these are the certificates that are the highest form of authentication on the web today where we verify not only the domain name belongs to the person applying for the certificate, we verify that the person applying for the certificate is authorized by the company to do so. And we also verify the company existence by looking at third-party documents and reputable sources to verify that it is a legitimate company. So that standard came out, I would say, around 2008. And then work started to develop the standard for the other types of certificates, which are known as DV or domain validated and OV or organizationally validated. And I believe those were issued around 2011-2012. Since then, the forum continues to meet on a regular basis, bi-weekly by telephone and three times a year face-to-face -face in different parts of the world. And it's a great way for both CAs and browsers to come together to talk about what issues they've seen, how they can be solved, and how to keep improving these standards which were developed quite a few years ago. Most recently in the CA Browser Forum, new working groups have been stood up, namely for code signing, And I think very soon we're going to have one for secure mail to be able to set standards for those particular areas. But it's a great group of international folks that are working cooperatively together to help improve the security of the Internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Very, very interesting um, to know that is CA Browser Forums bring these two words together because we are usually more familiar with a browser. You know, install someone tell no, install Firefox or install Chrome, so different people has different opinion which one is better or which one you trust the most. And right. There are a few of this, uh, but after all, we trust, right? We trust that they are secure, they, are, they don't have bugs, and they have the, the certificates that are there in, once you install the browser, already certificate are there. Yeah, excellent about that. You already mentioned the types of certificates, like the extended validation and then the OV, the organization validation. And you said that the highest level of, of assurance is the EV today? Yes, yes. Yes. Could you tell us more in practice how this, how a certification authority does that validation? I mean, how uh, rigorous is, imagine that I want to, I have a website and I want to have this certificate validated. What are the, what are the steps in concrete to, to have the EV issued? Sure. Right. So you're right. You're correct. EV is the highest form of authentication. And 
Therefore, it requires multiple steps on the role of the certificate authority to ensure that the person applying for the certificate is not a criminal and is actually that represents a legitimate business. And so first we have to do the same thing we do for all types of certificates, and that's to verify the domain name. So if let's say your company was Oscar, Oscar.com, we would go and verify that Oscar.com is a legitimate domain and that you have the ability to control that domain. So there's different ways that you can check the control of that domain. We can usually send an email to a domain that an email domain that we know belongs to you. And if you respond to that, that might be one way to do it. Another way is to have you put something on a particular web page that we can go and look at, like a shared secret. So there's multiple ways that we can confirm ownership of the domain. After we've confirmed ownership of the domain, we need to confirm that you are an authorized representative of the company to be able to request that certificate. So that would require us going to a public directory to find the phone number for your company, calling the number that we find in the directory, and having the phone transferred to your extension. So that would validate that you are actually part of that company. And then we have to validate the company's existence from a legal perspective. That would involve going into possibly a corporate registry for that particular country where it's registered. Let's say you are in Finland, so we probably have to go to the Finnish registry, verify that your company is registered as a business there, check those records, and uh, update our records accordingly. If you are a certain type of business that is not listed in a registry, we would require a legal opinion letter, which would mean you would have to go to a lawyer, mm -hmm. and they would just validate that you are a legitimate business and we would accept that letter. So yeah, there are different forms of different types of authentication we have to do to verify all this for EV. But once that's done, then you can receive the EV certificate. Now, what's important about the EV certificate is that it contains additional information than a domain validated or an organizationally validated certificate. And this can be viewed via the different browsers. Most browsers allow you to click on the lock and show that it is in fact an EV certificate. And the way you would verify this is because it will actually show the company name. For example, if you were to go to Bank bankofamerica.com with Chrome or Firefox or Edge, you would click on the lock and it would say uh, certificate issued to Bank of America Incorporated. And then in parentheses, it would say US, which is the region where it is incorporated. So other types of certificates do not have that information. And this is the distinguishing factor between EV certificates and other certificates. And if you wanted to get more information, such as the particular address where the company is located, you can click on more information and get all that information as well. So all of this information is there if someone needs it. It's not necessarily displayed to a user every day, mm -hmm. but it is there when they need it, especially if they're trying to find out, is this the real Ray-Ban that I want to go to? Yeah, exactly. One interesting point, the one you see that there is more information in the certificate. If you go to the browser, you can find much more information, the, the, name, the official name of the company, the jurisdiction, and more information. And one of the strongest things I can see of this is that It combines the digital world, so things that you can verify purely in the digital world, plus the physical world. Oh, they have to provide a, the physical address, so the certification authority is going to make calls to that existing so verification that are, are physical. And even in some cases, as you explained, uh, you have to visit a lawyer or do some paperwork, which might be in um, when it's difficult to truly validate the authenticity of the ownership of, of this. Yes. In fact, I love that analogy. I think, you know, bringing the digital and the physical world together into the digital certificate so that people can review things that they recognize in the physical world, like an address or a corporate registry. And having that in the digital certificate, which is verifying the authenticity of the website, I think this is a great analogy and, and is a way that makes it easy for folks to understand. Yes. And as, uh, well, We have announced a couple of months ago that we have a partnership between DigiCert and UV Secure, and the focus of this partnership is exploring how the legal entity identifier, LAIs, can help uh, certification authorities. So from your very vast experience and seeing a bit in the future what's going to happen, what consumer can expect from this relationship? Well, this is great. I think LEIs or legal entity identifiers are playing a, a very important role in the global business identification scheme. We see that that is extremely valuable. And I think that, as we said earlier, you know, there's a great way to marry the physical world and the digital world together by bringing together identity information into that digital certificate. LEIs provide another piece of that identity equation. These are identities that have been checked out by different registrars around the world and using a standards method that's prescribed by the uh, Global LEI Foundation, the GLIFE, 
puts these into a, a standard form that can be used around the world. And these LEI numbers can be easily checked using a reference database that's provided by Glyph to verify identity. So it's another piece of identifying information that can be used to connect those two worlds that we talked about. Currently, LEI numbers can be put into certain extensions in certificates, or excuse me, not extensions, but in certain fields of certificates, we are looking at ways that we can actually expand that a little bit more in the CA browser forum to allow for LEIs to be put in other particular fields of certificates that would make them more prominent to users and allow them to recognize them easier. We'll see if that actually happens. There are a lot of people that are for that, but there are some people that are against that. Mm -hmm. And we're going to keep pushing that to see if we can make that a reality. But I think it would be something that would be valuable to relying parties who are going to websites and looking at certificates, as well as entities that want to show relying parties who they are through the use of LEIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely has a really good potential to, to bring more transparency to the, the organizations that show it in, this, uh, in the certificates. Good. Something that I would like to ask you, because I know that you also belong to another very important organization, the ASC and you are leading the ASC X9 PKI study group. Tell us a bit of this organization and what you are doing there. Uh, sure. ASC X9 is a standards body for the financial community around security standards. And I think, you know, years ago, they were very concerned about using publicly trusted TLS certificates in financial devices. Think about automated teller machines, ATMs. Mm -hmm or credit card terminals, payment terminals. Because what happened many years ago, actually not that, not that many years ago, we moved, the industry moved from SHA-1 to SHA-2. And unfortunately, at that time, some of these payment terminals, these smaller devices, were older devices and did not, could not communicate using SHA-2. And therefore, they relied on SHA-1. But when the CA browser forum outlawed the use of SHA-1 for servers, those payment terminals could no longer connect to servers that were using SHA-2 certificates. Right. And so they essentially became dead devices. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there were a large number of these devices around the world that were basically stuck and merchants had to scramble and spend a lot of money to update those things on a very short notice. So the uh, ASCX9 group uh, wants to avoid any repeats of that mm -hmm. particular action. So they are looking at whether or not they should continue to use publicly trusted TLS certificates or come up with their own standard for TLS certificates and actually a PKI in their environment and for their users. We uncovered many different use cases for PKI in the financial community, and we are focusing on sort of the high priority ones in the second phase of the study to determine if a private PKI would be better for this community and how such a private PKI would be implemented. We expect to start phase two of that study group later this month. And the nice thing is we have broad participation from a wide variety of financial community participants involved in this study. I'm personally not from the financial community, but I think that's actually a good thing because I'm able to help guide this group along with my co-chair, who is a former MasterCard person. Mm -hmm. We're able to help guide this group without any sort of influence of being formerly in the financial community. However, we do have a lot of industry knowledge, as I mentioned earlier, being in this space for many years to help guide this group and come up with the right conclusion. Oh, yes. Sounds a really, really excellent initiative, this new working group. And Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good example of how sometimes part of the industry is leading one direction, of course, making innovations to make things more secure. But sometimes you don't, you well, somehow ignore or don't realize that other industries might not be in sync. And yeah, it's very, very interesting to hear that. And so we all uh, will benefit from the work done in this, in this initiative. Yes, I think so. So, Ding, now I would like to ask you if you can give us a tip for anybody how to protect our digital identities. Well, you know, being online these days, it can be very rewarding because we need to get business done. We need to access our accounts. Some of us take distance learning classes. We do research. And especially nowadays when many people are working from home due to this whole coronavirus situation, we have many people online at the same time at our homes in many different ages of our families. But what's important is that we have to protect our identities and our transactions online. And so there's a few things that we can do for that. Obviously, when we're online and doing financial transactions on websites, we need to look to ensure that those transactions are encrypted. And the one way to assure that is by looking for the lock in the website to show that the transaction is encrypted. The lock does not guarantee that you are at the website you think you are. 
So it's very important that you look at the website name, perhaps check the digital certificate that is securing that website before proceeding to enter personal information. But what good is encryption if we don't know who we are encrypting to? So being able to check the authenticity of the other end is very important. And then, of course, there are basic tips for protecting identity. Make sure you log out of websites when you're done. Don't just close the browser. Your web session might still be active. Make sure you update any antivirus software that you might be using on your computer. Do software updates on your operating system, whether you're on Apple, Macs, or PCs. These updates come out quite regularly, and make sure you stay up to date because those updates are there for your safety. And in addition, make those updates for your cell phones, your smartphones. Those devices are also very susceptible to hackers intercepting things, and that's why these devices, device manufacturers, come out with frequent security updates. So it's very important to ensure you're up to date there. In addition, most people don't even check this, but for computer manufacturers, they also offer their own updates. Lenovo, Dell, HP, for their own operating system, for their own firmware, Mm -hmm. for their own device drivers. It's important to check those on a regular basis to make sure you're up to date because hackers will take advantage of vulnerabilities and weaknesses in Wi-Fi networks, Bluetooth controls, et cetera, to ensure to try and attack your computer. So keeping those up to date is very important. You know, if you're using webcams or cameras on your phones, you know, there's been reports in the past where hackers have been able to get into those cameras without you even knowing it. And so keeping those cameras closed with either a a little sticky note or a piece of tape is not a bad thing to do. Those are some basic tips. I'm sure there are plenty of others we can think of, but that's the ones that pop into my head at the moment. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a a great reminder. There are many, many ways we can secure ourselves. Well, thanks a lot, Dean. It was a pleasure talking with you and know more about the certification authority and anything that is connected with that, you know, the financial industry, the browsers, and, and how LEIs can be in the future combined with this, with the certificates to provide us better security and securing our identities. Please, could you let us know how we can find you on the net? What are the best ways to find more about the work you're doing? Well, you can always follow me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Chosen Security. That's C-H-O-S-E-N Security, all one word. And I also publish periodically some blogs on digicert.com slash blog, and you'll find some articles there that I've written recently. I think those are probably the two best areas where you'll find some of the stuff that I've been doing. Also, if you're inclined to follow the activity of the CA Browser Forum, all that information is publicly available. You can go to cabforum.org, at cabforum.org, and you can sign up for the public email lists for any of the working groups or just the general email list. I'll warn you that you might get a lot of mail that you don't really want to see, but (laughs) nonetheless, you can always delete that part and and read what you want. So it would be interesting for those that have a very specific interest in this area. Excellent. Many ways to find you and all the work you're doing. So again, thanks for being here, uh, Dean, and all the best. Thank you, Oscar. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk About Digital Identity, produced by UbiSecure. Stay up to date with episode at ubisecure.com slash podcast or join us on Twitter at ubisecure and use the hashtag LTADI. Until next time, 